Good evening, everybody. I'm Keith Crumwoody, Dean of the Architecture Division at California College of the Arts. Thank you for joining us tonight for this lecture by Areed Halpern, the opening event of the Fall 2022 Architecture Lecture Series, Climate Justice, through which we will explore the entangled relationships between the climate crisis and racial and social justice. Please note that you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window with the live transcript button. As we return this year to fully in-person teaching, learning, and making on campus, we believe it's important to acknowledge the history of the land upon which we are working and honor those who came before us. At CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Wichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramaytu Shaloni peoples, who have continuously lived on this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you're joining us today. Before we begin tonight's event, I'd like to thank the organizers of this series, Irene Chang, Adam Marcus, and Naraj Bhatia, and tell you about the next event in our series. Next Thursday, September 29th at 6 p.m., Daniel Aldana Cohen, Assistant Professor of Sociology at UC Berkeley and co-author of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, will lecture in person here on our San Francisco campus. You can register for this event by visiting our website at scaffold.architecture.cca.edu, where you can see the full lecture series schedule, watch videos of past events, and read stories by and about our students, faculty, and alumni. And now I'll hand it to Irene Chang, Associate Professor and Co-Director of CCA's History Theory Experiments Lab, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, it's my honor to introduce Orit Halpern. Um, Orit is a professor and chair of digital cultures and societal change at the University of Technology um, at Dresden. And her work is situated at the intersection um, of the history of science, computing, cybernetics, and design. She's published a number of um, books, including um, her first book, Beautiful Data, A History of Vision and Reason, which looks at the history of um, data and more broadly changes in human attention, rationality, um, and the way we observe and analyze the world. Her current book project is called um, The Smartness Mandate, and it looks at the history of smart, smart technologies and artificial intelligence, including how these technologies relate to issues of uh, resource extraction, environment, and what they spell for the future of the planet. So as we delve into the issues of climate justice um, uh, and, and kind of related matters this semester, we're really excited to have Orit here to help us understand and connect these questions of um, data, technology, climate, environment, and politics. Um, please join me in welcoming Orit Halpern to CCA. Thank you for that really generous introduction. And yeah, I'll make a plug. The book is coming out in December. You need to unmute so please. Arit. Oh, I think I am unmuted. Huh. Okay. Try You're good. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, thank you for that super generous invitation. And thank you uh, for bringing me here. And hopefully this can be the start of a conversation because I myself um, feel probably quite amateur, uh, probably compared to many of the people in the room and the work that you're doing um, at the CCA. And also, um, uh, thank you for mentioning my book. And yeah, I'll make a plug. It's coming out in December. It's called The Smartness Mandate. It's with Robert Mitchell. And today I'm going to show like a little bit of the more contemporary uh, part, some part of fieldwork that I had actually done on digital infrastructures in the Atacama Desert, but I've been more broadly and lots of people have done work on this um, site. So I'm not sure if it's the most revelatory work, but it's prompted a lot of questions for me, not just about uh, how we study and think about and situate digital technologies in relationship to the environment and, and digital infrastructures and big data infrastructures, but also um, 
more broadly, this came out of work that I was doing in on research studios um, with and in participation with architecture uh, uh, students. And it brings up also really interesting questions we can talk about, about like the ethics and the modes of encounter that we'd have with the research studio as we're kind of going out into certain sites and, and how we think about that. And that, so in that sense, I, you know, how do we acknowledge um, this possession, indigeneity, difference, um, but, and also um, as we're kind of working at, at speed, essentially, uh, in, in particular ways and, and time. So I'm gonna just go along and uh, share my screen here. Uh, so, hold on. So um, I'm telling this talk, the planetary experiments, and I've been thinking a lot lately about um, not just histories of cybernetics, but also um, histories of the changing way that we're actually experimenting at scale from the green revolution to um, geoengineering uh, with the fate of the planet and what are the, what are the um, different ethical and, and, and um, political concerns that follow this kind of mode of experimentation and testing uh, since World War II. Uh, and that I also see closely related to uh, digital culture and digital technology. So just as a word of background, I'm a historian of science who works on histories of cybernetics design in the human sciences. And I've worked a lot in the past, if you read my other books, contesting such concepts as smartness, and obviously is what I'm coming. And this is Songdo in South Korea. Uh, an ubiquitous or uh, smart city in the, depending on whose parlance you're using that I've done an extensive amount of work and it's kind of a greenfield city grafted out of the ocean. So it itself, even though it's always in the name of sustainability and greenness, obviously it's an environmentally uh, devastating site really. Um, and this is sort of being rolled out in many places in the world as sort of the future and there's all sorts of questions that these sort of infrastructures posit. In my work, I've been focusing a lot on data aesthetics and governmentality. So kind of the construction of these immersive environments that are now um, ubiquitous. And I've been thinking about that historically, of course, within histories of the Cold War, militarization, race, and sex. Um, and so I've been looking a lot uh, in my previous and also my current work at how, for example, race warfare in the United States was transformed through new strategies in design and data collection. So this is um, some images of Forrester. So you see the rise of kind of these kind of technical and RAN based solutions and, and smartness in the wake of sort of this sort of urban warfare, uh, race warfare that's occurring in the late 60s. And I'm kind of really studying how um, race becomes the underpinning about how these new strategies in design and data collection ultimately, and this is uh, an example of architecture machine group running a series of kind of tests or polls on these African-American men in, in Boston housing units who supposedly, um, automate, if you will, the system of urban planning um, and how these new methods and design and data turn ultimately into personalization and interactivity. So how structural problems have now folded into our modes of immersive interactivity. The, autom the automation and perhaps technicization of politics and the demos leading to so many of our contemporary smart city uh, and big data collecting infrastructures such as Hudson Yards uh, in New York. But lately I've also taken these current, current concerns into engaging with ecology and with infrastructure. And while these might not seem like intuitive places to think about big data, um, obviously these are some of the most uh, data intensive and automated landscapes on earth. So I've been, I've been working for a number of years in um, Northwestern Quebec and these areas in Val d'Or um, around these gold mines and now um, lithium mines. And that kind of brings me to some of the other work I've been doing on, on big data infrastructures or work I did do um, on big data infrastructures in the Atacama. 
So these have prompted a whole new series, not only about the materialities and infrastructures of digital media, which probably most of you are quite familiar with, but this I question about um, what, what would we need to learn? So uh, probably this is very adolescent. Everyone's like, I really hate these guys, but um, I've always found learning from Los Angeles, but, uh, Las Vegas, both an infuriating, but also compelling challenge about what it would mean, what discourse, what glossary, what new um, vocabularies would we have to develop and what new forms would we have to imagine to engage with our contemporary anthropocenic um, landscapes um, and the current kind of turn scale changes that are going on in the environment. So what would we learn, to, what would we have to change versus what was happening in the seventies? And of course there are so many um, to engage with our artificially intelligent and machine learning systems. What might we learn from landscapes? Um, so I want to engage a lot of the normative assumptions that were originally imbued in this sort of mode of architectural learning, and also try to think about what it would mean to develop a, land, um, a landscape for contemporary machine learning and big data infrastructures. And so I'm going to start in what might seem like an unintuitive location, the Atacama Desert in Chile is a topological site for envisioning and mapping technical futures. I want to preface I'm not an expert on Chile. I'm beholden to a large team of people for this work, particularly I participated in a project called Logistical Worlds um, with a group from um, Western Sydney. Uh, I also was working with a number of um, other my grad students from new school. So there's a lot of people whose work um, I kind of was in conversation with to do this. And so this is totally speculative, maybe even irresponsible um, kind of mapping of this space to think about. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna open with a series of images. The first one is the ALMA installation an astronomical observatory that was part of the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, the next image is the lithium beds in the Solar de Atacama, a site of intense speculation on the future of energy and um, technology. And the third figure is the insignia for the Center of Mathematical Modeling in the University of Chile, Santiago. This is a globally renowned research institute for applying advanced maths from astronomy, geophysics, geology to providing big data solutions through machine learning for mining, education, resource management, biology, and health. So this territory bridges data and matter, and these sites are the producers of some of the largest non-proprietary data sets on Earth and providers of many of the very materials that create the information age. And this talk will argue that collectively, this sites form the landscape of what I'm titling a planetary testbed or experiment. We can talk about the difference. A petri dish cultivating potential futures, but also foreclosing potential futures for life, politics, and technology on both Earth and beyond. So to start one, lesson number one, an event horizon, a point of no return, a boundary beyond which events cannot affect an observer on the opposite side of it. On April 10th, 2019, the first image of a black hole appeared to humanity. To produce this miracle demanded that scientists and engineers from a team spanning the globe turn the earth itself into a vast sensor to gather data from black holes. The event horizon telescope, only a dish the size of this planet, could create a sensor sensitive enough to collect weak electromagnetic signals from 50 million plus light years away in order to provide a long last empirical evidence supporting Einstein's theory of relativity. When the image was released, it circulated at literally the speeds of light across that most human and social of networks, the internet. Comments online range from amazement to vast frustration in the future that the black hole did indeed look like we just like we thought it might. Awesome, amazing, mystical, capable of making humans fall in love. These are the kind of quotes in the New York Times and other venues jockeyed with anticlimactic really, and it looks like the Eye of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Maybe, such commentators suggest, the culmination of having turned our whole planet into a technology is just a fake artifact of computer graphics algorithms, merely another stereotypical image recalling long-standing standard Western cultural tropes of radically alien and powerful forces. This 
event image crystallizing both new imaginaries of the future and mobilizing our oldest and most repeated conventions of what extreme non-human alterity might look like. Whatever the truth of this image, I argue that this image provides evidence of a radical reformulation of perception. This image presents both the figure of the terminal limits of human perception, while simultaneously embodying a new form of experience comprised not within any one human or even technical installation, but through the literal networking of the entire planet into a sensor perception instrument and experiment. This image is an allegory, therefore, of the very artificial intelligence and machine learning systems that underpin it, while simultaneously embodying a classic problem in both physics and computation, mainly the impossibility of objectivity and the limits of being able to calculate or access infinity. As I will show, both these problems are deeply intertwined with how we are currently governing and managing life on Earth through computation. So coming to lesson two, extraterrestriality. One of the key installations in the project was the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, the ALMA installation. On March 13th and 14th, 2017, I visited this installation. Located in the Shanjanto Plateau in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the radio telescopes are 5,050 meters up high in one of the driest and most extreme environments, or supposed driest and most extreme environments on Earth, although it's very dry and extreme. This technical infrastructure combined with an environment that, uh, that it, among the most arid on Earth produced strange aesthetic effects as you kind of wander around. And I found myself kind of falling into like kind of stereotopic, stereotypical sort of images or imaginaries of, um, of, you know, what exactly this place was about because it indeed kind of fit my uh, imagination, if you will, problematically perhaps of a set for a science fiction um, movie. In my mind, the apparatus reflected and advanced every fantasy of extraplanetary exploration I read as a child in science fiction fantasy books and watched on NASA-sponsored public programming on TV. This analogy, however, is not just fiction. NASA and other space agencies use this desert to test equipment, train astronauts, and study the possibility of astrobiology, of the future planets we might colonize. And here, speaking of architecture, sort of um, complicit or implication within how we're envisioning extraplanetary life is, of course, Foster and pa um, Partners kind of projection um, for both moon um, moon installations, these kind of 3D printed uh, colonies um, and extraction sites that are going to now uh, fill the um, uh, uh, solar system. So NASA and other space agencies use this uh, desert to test um, equipment, train astronauts, and study the possibility of astrobiology of the future planets we will colonize. If the event horizon is the point of no return, the Atacama is the landscape of that horizon, the infrastructure for imaginaries of abandoning Earth and never returning to the past. But again, this is an irony, actually, because the ALMA collects history. Every signal process day or is eons old, millions, if not billions of light years in time space. And to process the most ancient of signals demands, of course, the latest in machine learning methods and other analytic techniques. These data sets are used utilized in partnership by Microsoft and other similar organizations as training sets because they're highly complex and difficult to clean noise from signals and they invo involve and they provide environments um, uh, prefer uh, testing algorithms, experimenting with both new approaches to supervised and especially on supervised learning. So this is kind of a major space where people are kind of envisioning or imagining uh, not only uh, reaching space and visualizing, um, if you will, the secrets of the universe, it's a highly kind of colonial um, fantasy space, but also, of course, this fantasy of um, data driven uh, learning or, or knowledge production. And having never seen a black hole, of course, and never being able to, what should we look for? The machines, it appears, will help us decide. To process this data, figure ground relations are literally confused. The official tour guide tells me that these telescopes contain units at the base that you can see that is the temperature of deep space in order to isolate and process signals um, 
from space and separate them from the quote unquote noise that comes from the earthly atmosphere. Uh, in this installation, data is literally being contextualized in an interesting way in an environment being built within the experimental setup, the furthest outside to earth being recreated within these machines. But perhaps this is the lesson of all scientific experiments. We create environments that are always already artificial and make nature from them. And if we take the event horizon as an allegory for our present where we have turned the earth into a medium for information gathering, if you think about the fact that we turn the whole planet into parabola for gathering data from deep space and analysis, then this is even more true. The sites of data protection, data gathering and analysis are increasingly blurry within this kind of infrastructure. And we can think of the planet almost as media, which brings us to lesson three, energy. The earth as medium is a truism in the Atacama that takes many forms. Chile as copper is an often repeated mantra in the space I'm told by Katie Detweiler, an anthropologist working in the Atacama and my guide to this place. And copper is in almost every machine, the conductor of all electricity. And the Atacama has some of the largest copper mines on earth, particularly this one, Chiquicamada. Um, copper, however, is an industrial material. It also rests, although perhaps only for now, on an industrial economy. Copper markets are still relatively unleveraged, unlike some other energy, mineral, and metal markets. There's little futures or derivative action. As a commodity, it suffers from modern concepts, economic concepts of things like business cycles, and its political economy is seemingly still grounded in terms like GDP and GNP, along with concepts stretching from Thomas Malthus and Adam Smith in the 18th century of resource limitation, scarcity, demand, price, and above all, population and nation. In Chile, copper is equated above all with nationalism. Under Pinochet, counter to what your expectation might be, these mines were actually unionized. And the state corporation Cadeco continues to smelt all the copper. This rather surprising history for a dictator whose name is synonymous with Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys emerged from an alignment with right wing nationalists, authoritarianism, neoliberalism, and the unions. Um, but a few miles away from um, Chicacamara is. Uh, another landscape of extraction, metal, and energy. This one is linked to the stars in the future, SpaceX, Tesla, and the high-tech industries that in theory will eventually replace the vestiges of our old heavy industrial and carbon-based economies all uh, bank on the Atacama. From this desert also lies the new gold, the future Saudi Arabia, I'm told by business journals and newspapers, the Salar de Atacam. Uh, these salt flats bear lithium. This is the most light of metals, the future supposedly of both machines and energy, the medium that will replace the carbon futures that financial markets and nations have so heavily bought into and leveraged. Um, the beds are, be the, sorry. Um, the beds are beautiful uh, and they're created by brine just brought to the surface. Lithium is never pure. It is mixed with other things, also valuable magnesium and potassium. And you can see the kind of shifting change of colors in the field um, as they kind of slowly dry out and get, re uh, and get closer to um, becoming uh, lithium salt, which is the like super blue, at which point the salt is scraped from the bed, harvested, separated from the trace boron and magnesium and affixed with sodium carbonate for sale. Alejandro Booker, the technical manager of this installation takes us on a, on a tour. Um, uh, takes us on a tour. Um, SQM, he tells us, is environmentally excellent. There's almost no chemicals are used in the process. The extraction of lithium is solar powered. The sun, in theory, sorry, dehydrates the water and draws off the salt, a pure process, except it drains water. He assures us, however, that the latest expansions and technical advances will optimize this problem. Better water evaporation capture systems and the planned desalinization plants will reduce the impact on this desert, which is the driest on earth, and on the brine waters that are also the springs for supporting fragile ecosystems of shrimps, bacteria, and flamingos. Environmentalists, however, beg to differ. Inquiries have gone into the environmental impact of the fields and the general process of assessment has been critiqued as opaque. 
Indigenous communities are also threatened by the removal of water. Their existence is in question. So there's a kind of water battles um, around this supposedly super clean energy. Apparently the promise of carbon neutrality does not mean the promise of decolonization um, apparent, um, does not mean the promise of decolonization and a release from extractionary logic. And similar contests are currently happening in Canada in the mining spaces for lithium in Northern Quebec. I don't have any pictures of that. What Pinochet never did privatize mining is now fully private with lithium. While Sociedad Química y Minera SQM is Chilean, it is private. SQM has been attacked for anti-trade union practices and unions are fighting to label lithium um, in fact, they've succeeded now with COVID, a matter of national security, so the state can better regulate the material. This um, space also partakes in planetary games of logistics around belt roads and resources. In 2018, the Chinese corporation Tanke acquired a 24% share of SQM. BYD, also um, a very big uh, electric car manufacturer, um, has been also trying to um, increase development and buy in. There's been uh, currently these national security concerns that are sort of been blocking some of these Chinese buys along with um, kind of collapsing uh, markets and financial thing problems. Uh, the point being, obviously there's um, perhaps a new or perhaps it's just an old, uh, but there's new players uh, form of geopolitics kind of forming around uh, these new sites of energy. And so in Chile, this is increasingly, there's, the unions are trying to get legislation around making it a national security concern so that these mines are not um, sold off to investors that uh, would, vi would violate union interests. And while the government continues to monitor the situation and demand limits of Chinese participation on the board of the corporation, the situation continues to fluctuate. Um, but nonetheless, these mines are actually not very heavily unionized, unlike the, the copper. Uh, these games also demand ever more privatized water supplies. Water is a massive um, commodity, obviously, is a massive commodity. The largest desalinization plant uh, on Earth will soon be built in the Atacama as well to fuel the future of mining, both uh, of copper, lithium, and, and uh, other materials. Um, the global syndicate Veolia, which is a whole other story on kind of oligopolistic control of water, um, has is currently bidding for one of these contracts. And the new infrastructure of corporate actors merging high tech with salt and water have all emerged in order to support our fantasies uh, of eternal growth so that we may drive clean cars and eventually arrive to the stars. Um, to extract ever more materials. These salts are also fragile infrastructures for unique ecosystems. It's in the service of imagining the future on other planets that drives another group of scientists, astrobiologists, to study the bacteria in these brines. These bacteria have evolved, apparently, um, differently. The extreme salts of the condition might offer some clues, these scientists tell us, of life on Mars. So, um, Gatacom is also a place where astrobiologists are seeking and uh, these types of uh, life forms that live in environments that might suggest to us how to terraform um, uh, either anaerobic environments or extremely saline environments that might um, suggest how we might terraform other planets. So these cellular creatures in theory hold the key to survival in space and to the liveliness that might exist on other planets. We cannot uh, many of them argue, ex expect to be alone in the universe. And these bacteria allow us to envision in their novel metabolisms and capacity to live under pH conditions, lethal to most other organisms, another way to live. These beds, the astrobiologists are, you cannot be taken away to make batteries. They harbor our key to space, the way to terraform. What are we to do then in cases where the future to be driven by these batteries disappear as we make them? which brings us to lesson four optimization. The lithium mines more than anything suggest new attitudes or maybe practices of boundary making and market making. 
They demonstrate a move away from the perfect stabilities of supply and demand curves to the plasticity of another order of algorithmic finance and logistical management. The relationship between these very different and radically shifting territories of mining, salt harvestry, and astronomy can therefore only be realized in this kind of turn to mathematics. The incommensurability and scale of materials between the operations of the mines and the seeming metaphysical interests of astronomical sciences is unified at the center of mathematical modeling and located in Santiago, some 1600 kilometers south of the Atacama. It's one of the world's premier mathematics research centers for applied math in mining. And a few days after I visit Alma, I visit the center. In the lecture room there, uh, we are brought to hear the presentations of, numerous, of a number of researchers presented to us on themes of how machine learning, big data, and complex modeling might transform not only mining, but of course, the, size, the whole society. As you see here, we have resilient cars and integrated vehicles, all part of this kind of smart society with security and management information. And one of the lead scientists and mathematical modeling at the cellar at the center, Alejandro Hofre is trained in optimization and game theory. He explains the center's mission is to bring the best in mathematical modeling to bear on questions of mine optimization, discovery, and supply chain management. Cheapening and improving exploration is very critical, as it is the most expensive and difficult uh, part of the extraction industry process, often bearing no return. And the search way to way, the way to do more with less is also necessary as the materials on earth are without question running out. But this finitude in resources, so, you know, or, or quality is severely degraded. Usually you get very, very small parts per million of uh, whether it's copper or um, other materials. So there's this constant turn to figuring out how to model geology using a lot of geosensing, um, and automation to kind of monitor and deal with the mining in real time, as well as in the uh, discovery process in order to achieve um, better results and to optimize uh, limited resources. Uh, this new optimization economy is also aligned um, as the executive manager of innovation and development at this, at the, at this lab with rethinking mining unions and labor. The hierarchies of the mine, they say, must go to be instead managed by regular feedback loops derived from billions of sensors and automated systems. And in fact, Toyota, a lot of automated cars and trucks are, are being tested out um, in some of these mining installations. And they sense and decide the best actions, the best manner to ventilate, heat, cool, dig, chemically separate, mix, dispose, and scavenge through material. The space of mining open to the space of mathematics and abstraction, making ter Terran limits plastic, scavengeable, optimizable, and ultimately grounded in the math of physics and astronomy. And in fact, they very often explain that they do import a lot of algorithms between um, the astronomical observatories and sort of the way they're kind of dealing with their data sets at the center, that that's been a, a very fruitful um, interchange. The space of money, um, uh, in fact, I would argue that we're moving to a kind of post-optimization zone, a world where despite limits, smarter infrastructures now are understood not only to make systems resilient, but actually super more productive than they've ever been. And in fact, there's never been more mining going on. Uh, the quantities, and I'll have the exact numbers um, right here. The quantities being mined of have, have never been greater in Chile, but also true of Canada. There's actually been exponential growth in the landscape due to kind of new technologies and the ability to kind of stretch the li li lives of these um, mining installations through better tech and more way to kind of scavenge the materials and, and um, extract uh, uh, finer from finer and more granular quantities of, of um, minerals and metals. Um, so I would suggest we're moving into this kind of post-optimization zone and these communication systems, complex geological models, fluid and energy and communication systems might also find their use in other places. Uh, over lunch, I'm told that entire computational infrastructures are being built for the purpose, and ultimately the maths being generated might be used in asteroid and other mining. And in fact, Goldman Sachs released a report almost synchronously with my visit, arguing for the future of asteroid mining on 
April 6, 2017. The Sachs report was bullish on asteroid mining, while the psychological barrier the, the report noted to mining asteroids is high, the actual financial and technological barriers are far lower. Uh, spacecraft and space travel is getting cheaper, and asteroids could be grabbed and hauled into low Earth orbit for mining. And they worked with Caltech to do this report that building asteroid grabbing spacecraft would cost the same as setting up a mine on Earth, particularly at the Pacific uh, Rim. And I've talked to lots of geoengineers who think we will indeed get to the asteroids before we get um, to the floor of the Pacific. And Goldman Sachs definitely urges speculation on space. While the markets may tank on Earth, there's no question that humanity will supposedly need these materials. Back on Earth in Santiago, researchers speak of how astronomy's wealth of data and complicated analytics can be brought to bear on developing the complex mathematics for geological discovery and simulations of mine stability and resources. The discussion also indicates a shift of economy, perhaps from extraction to, um, to kind of some sort of post-optimization, vast arrays of sensors, ever more refined chemistry, and reorganized labor and supply chains are developed whose main function is to provide raw data for machine learning. The one theory rummaged the tailings, discarded materials, supplementary and surplus substances um, to old, of older extractive processes in order to reorganize the production, distribution, recycling of materials. Um, so we're kind of seeing these kind of such as the search for other metals and tailing ponds. And this is particularly prevalent in Canada where I work, where now everyone's like, maybe we can, we weren't looking for the rare earths. Uh, we can go back and try to extract additional or find other materials in the supposed waste of these. So that waste is now becoming kind of valuable, but also valuable as a building material um, and cement and so on and so forth. So these computational industrial assemblers just create new economies of scavenging. Uh, uh, through uh, this waste, and it's quite in vogue globally. In this logic, the seeming final limits of life and resources become instead an extendable threshold that can be infinitely stretched to the application of ever finer and more environmentally pervasive forms of calculation, technology, and computation to facilitate the optimization, ever finer salvage and extraction of finite materials. I might argue that this optimization is the perverse parallel of the event horizon. If one watches a clock fall into the event horizon, all one will see is time forever slowing down. The horizon will never be reached. History eternally deferred. In a grotesque mirror, futures are always deferred through big data, financial algorithms, and machine learning practices, except we're not traveling at the speed of light, and the earth is not a black hole. Rather, these practices make crisis and impossibility and blind us to the depletion of the ecosystem and the many people who live there. So one of the things I'm doing a lot of work on right now is finance. I'm really interested in the way we hedge bets that we're literally hedging on negative futures. And yet the logic of credit debt swapping or shorting a bet is that you never have to find out what happens, except that of course, um, those responsibilities and those risks are being um, unequally distributed. Uh, which brings me to the question of temporalities. So the desert I visit therefore is both the site of new capacities to recognize new forms of life in astrobiology, for example, um, or new maths or, or fluid dynamics in the real-time monitoring and modeling of massive minds, which produce new images of the universe. The Atacama maybe is always dying. It's flora and fauna and people since uh, I didn't have enough time to talk extensively about the indigenous situation, but it's deeply affected by these SQM um, mines as well. Uh, but as engineers at SQM tell me that the new technologies will allow them to optimize water usage, to recycle and collect what um, evaporates, um, and make the water uh, in the desert. What was once a limited finite resource such as water is now elastic, optimize, optimizable, and the environment is supposedly fortified and made resilient. The new minerals and economies of space and lithium envisioned to replace the older materials and energies of industrialism will all be also run on algorithmic finance markets, hyperspeculation, and embrace of transformation and shock. So resource limitations and catastrophic environmental events, oh, sorry, 
are no longer understood as a crisis necessitating a response through expertise and Milton Friedman fiscal policies, but rather as ongoing processes that can be incrementally experimented with and addressed through endless adjustments and manipulations in time and data collection. But time and data can be manipulated in many ways. Back on Earth, there's a film that came out in 2010, Waiting for the Light by Patricio Guzman. In the immediate aftermath of the coup on September 11th, 1973, there was the subsequent torture and disappearance of thousands of the, and the exile of nearly 10% of the population. The paramilitary talked uh, stalked Chile. Traveling in a Puma helicopter from detention site to detention site, the so-called caravan of death carried out the execution of 26 people in Chile south and 71 in the desert north. Their bodies were buried in unmarked graves or thrown from the sky into the desert. The desert was militarized and turned into a weapon for the killing of dissidents and for the training of troops as resources supporting the state. Guzman parallels the search for bodies by mothers of um, of dissidents killed by Pinochet with astronomers watching the sky um, in the Atacama high altitude observatories. The wave millimeters uh, arrays hadn't been operational when he made the movie. Yeah. Above all, his theme is that the landscape is a recording device for both human and inhuman memories, the trace of stars 50 million years ago, uh, and the search for loved ones with their human lives. The implication of the film, that the desert itself provides some other intelligence or maybe memory and not even just for humans. When I hear scientists talk of the possibility of real-time decision-making and mining and the optimization of energy and materials to the perfection of sensing technology and big data in the mind, I hear a dual fantasy of stretching finite resources into infinite horizons through big data and artificial intelligence. I also hear a smaller, more embodied parallel fantasy um, of a new form of experience and cognition no longer nested in single human bodies, whether those of laborers or those of expert economists, and rather bequeathed to large networks of humans and machines. These dreams of artificial intelligence and machine learning managed resection might hold back to the history of machine learning. Machine learning, at least since the 1950s, has been about revising cognition, but also what might denote denote human history or perception. For insofar as most machine learning methods require training data, the computer equivalent of a parent correcting a child or uh, computers could in principle be trained on what was in essence population level experience, right? Computers don't learn from just one individual. Experience here has moved outside the individual. It's the data set, the environment, the sensor system that becomes the object of design. That is, though each human individual is limited by that set of external stimuli, a computer can draw on huge databases of training data that the results of judgments and experiences of not just one individual, but rather a large population. These infrastructures are ubiquitous today, of course, think Mint's data set or Google image training sets or any number of things. And of course, they inherit with them any number of normative, problematic histories of race and population. But they've also fundamentally maybe have the option to transform how we understand perception and cognition in our relationship to each other. I wonder then at this condition we live in and it's linked to the artificial intelligence that have fundamentally positioned experience as a matter of extra human or personal relations, perhaps beyond Terran experience. We've turned our whole planet into a device for sensing the deepest, coldest space. The first wager perhaps and the biggest gamble we're taking as a species, but not equally and of course not with all the same agency. If optimization is the event horizon of earthbound ecologies, very limit of this historical imaginary of economy by making it difficult to imagine running out of materials or suffering catastrophic events, then the event horizon appears as the very image to replace the finitude of the earth. In a pessimistically optimistic vein, however, this might also be the final possibility to undo the very fantasies of modern colonialism, imperialism, and anthropocentrism. There's hope in these infinitesimally specific signals found of a black hole from eons ago beyond human, even Terran time. They're reminded that there are experiences that can only emerge through the global networks of sensory and measuring instruments, that there are radical possibilities in realizing that learning and experience might not be internal to subjects, but shared, perhaps these are just realizations of what we've known all along, that our worlds are comprised of relationship to others, 
but there is a possibility that never has this been more evident or may, been made more visible through our, than through our new technologies, even our financial technologies and artificial intelligences. As they automate and traumatize us, they also reveal perhaps what's always been there, the socio-technical networks that exist beyond and outside of us, realities impossible to fully visualize. These new assemblages also allow a reflexive critique when we discuss AI in terms of national competition or the ongoing abstraction and rationalization from an analog world, are we taking seriously enough the reformulations of time and space facilitated by these very techniques or our own investment in entanglement with socio-technical systems or history? The Event Horizon Telescope presents us with a radical encounter with our inability to ever be fully objective and the possibility that there are things to learn and forms of experience that are beyond the demands of capital or economy in our present. My hope is that perhaps encountering the impossibility of ever imagining the reality of the Event Horizon might finally be able to witness and engage the precarious reality of life on Earth. And kind of to end on this, I'm sort of thinking about, well, I was thinking more hopefully actually a few weeks ago when I first prepared this about the sort of way that uh, social networks also permit new forms of collectivity and social action. In this case, the protests that came throughout uh, Chile throughout 2018 and 2019 and kind of brought um, new government to power and a very interesting constitutional process that tried to integrate women, indigenous groups really kind of transform, I think, relations to uh, history and what the future of the country would be. Unfortunately, um, that pros that constitution has now been sort of rejected by the, the voters. So I don't know where that leaves us, um, but that's something um, that I'm trying to think about and understand in terms of um, how we understand the relation between the Anthropocene technology um, and perhaps the, the, con the possibility of uh, Pearl democracy is where we live with those who are not like ourselves. So uh, I'll leave it there. And thank you so much. Sorry, I don't know if that was a little long. No, that was perfect, Dorit. Thank you. Great. So now we have a little time for um, Q and A, and um, this is a bit of an experiment. Uh, I'm not uh, hearing anyone. Oh. Not sure what's going on here. Speak again. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Who can't hear? Ari? Ari, can you hear me? I'm gonna figure out what's going on. Ari? Okay. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, great. So we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, thank you so much for that really thought provoking lecture. And I, you know, you, you laid so much out on the table. So I'm kind of like still processing um, the different scales and realms that um, you traversed in the talk. Um, this is a bit of an experiment um, because we have um, members of the audience on Zoom and in person. So, um, we thought maybe we would start with any questions um, from Zoom participants and then um, maybe take questions from the, um, the people in the digital craft lab. How does that sound? Good to and If you're on Zoom and you'd like to just uh, type in your question to the chat, you can also do that and we will read it. Um, let's go to um, also, Anissa, let's just do like the full, um, all participants view. So we actually feel like we're immersed in the room. There we go. Or if we have questions from the digital craft lab. I see it, someone walking towards the... We have one. We, go. Oh, no, we have to stand right here. <laughs> Speak loud. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I guess my question has to do with sort of the. We can't hear you. If you, oh, you can. Try again. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear? Yes, yeah. I can hear uh, you. Yeah. My my question has to do with the sort of exponentially rapid pace of specialization in different sectors and whether that um, that 
that need to uh, sort of have things optimized in real time could outpace the collective mobility of um, sort of the, the internet of social uh, relationships uh, that that need to be sort of taken into account and uh, you know resist that structuralist approach to understanding of our environment and in the future. I, have, I hope that question makes sense. Like, is there an appetite? No, that, <laughs> that is a totally brilliant question. And I actually wish I had an answer, except to say like, and since I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a, um, an engineer, but I do think actually one of the things we really have to struggle with and complicate is what and how we understand optimization. And I think it's a lot about, um, it, there's real politics to measurement and uh, metrics and, and how we understand outcomes, because that's so much about how you understand anyway, how, you know, what it means to, op, like, what are you optimizing at what scale? What, what's the actual boundaries of a system? What models do we have? How do we understand broader questions like adaptation, evolution? Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's something really, it's a, it's a topic I didn't bring up but um, for example, a, a term I'm sure you're very familiar with is resilience. I do a lot of work on resilience and the history of resilience as an ecological idea. Um, you know, it's really interesting in the in theories about what makes systems resilient. There's always a question about like, if the system's perfectly optimized, can it actually survive change? Can it adapt? Uh, and this is a long running actually question about excess and in in, in diversity in nature. Uh, and um, I think it's really important for us to retrieve these ar arguments. Not only that, they're incredibly racialized and, and sexual. And there's a whole question here about form and function. It's, a, it's an issue that's come up in obviously in histories of architecture and theories of architecture quite intensely around critiques of modernity. But I think it's now been adjoined to a really new set of technical practices that you're pointing at, like when people are hyper specialized and working on one particular problem in one particular little location, like what it's very possible that, and in fact, that's where I kind of leave on like a pessimistic note. I'm like, well, this whole thing, I was really hopeful. I was like, look at Chile, they're like doing this amazing thing. Um, and then now we don't know what's going to happen with it. I mean, hopefully that process is still amazing and happening. But, you know, so I really recognize that there's a disjuncture in time. There's like different scales going on and that there's real battles going on about how we measure and model um, change adaptation evolution, uh, both in, in the technical and, and political and environmental sense. So I can just say we really need to complicate the term optimization a lot and um, and put it in relation to other languages and ideas. But, and that, I have no solution, except that I worry with you that that's happening. Thank you. I have um, a kind of general impression or question. I, I, I love the arc of your lecture and the kind of, um, effective arc of it. I mean, for, for most of it, I was sort of increasingly plunged into this like pessimism. I mean, I think you use the word like optimistic pessimism or something at the end. I mean, it was like- Yeah, yeah. This is pessimistic such a, this, optimism. Pessimistic <laughs> optimism. I mean, the, the, the reality that you're describing is so dystopian. Um, and, it, or, it, you know, it could have that kind of flavor of sort of like, um, uh, you know, what has man wrought in terms of like our ever, you know, e even as we are developing technologically, we're just finding more and more ways to extract and, um, you know, even now like sift through waste, industrial waste and, you know, um, find that last increment, um, you know, as we approach this kind of, and then, you know, with the image of the in in event horizon, it's like, it's never ending. It's ever, you know, um, but then you kind of do this turn at the end, and this is where the kind of optimism comes in by suggesting that this kind of change in the structure of perception and consciousness into this, you know, uh, I don't know if you would call it, you called it uh, post-optimization, but there's a kind of flavor of the post-human, right? And in, in the kind of collective seeing that's that is called into being by these um, new technologies that it gives rise to like a, 
uh, other kind of political consciousness. I, I, I don't know if I'm sort of getting that roughly correctly, but um, so I'm wondering about like, how, how does that connection happen? You know, how do you get from the telescopic array to the protests and mass movements? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I didn't successfully do so. So that might be like a leap of hope. Um, I mean, ultimately, right, we wouldn't do what we do if we didn't actually think it, it might also maybe not affect change globally or immediately, but uh, that there's a place that criticism also puts things in the world. For me, though, and I didn't really get to, you know, in some sense here, I was trying to negotiate a lot of stuff. But in a lot of my work, I spend a lot of time trying to um, ask very seriously about the inconsistencies, frictions, and also productive productivities of assemblages. Like what happens when these older extraction industries are laid over, these newer technologies are laid over, um, transforming environmental and also social landscapes what happens and and you know not everything works that seamlessly either and what i found in terms of thinking about the actual logic of the mathematics center more than anything like what they were assembling together and also the issue like the inconsistencies that were emerging out of sort of not only the data they had collated but also what they were trying to achieve in terms of this like clean, sustainable society that is still going to have mining um, was something that also starts to make you think about um, how these, these practices and algorithms connect us, right? Like it is creating new relations. And the theorist, Randy Martin, I, I think a lot about this with things like the subprime mortgage situation of 2008, the way that suddenly like Poor people and you know slightly rich, you know upper middle class or middle class or people were suddenly grouped together in the, and and experiencing something perhaps they would never have experienced jointly, not in a good way necessarily, but also in a way that perhaps could be activated politically in an interesting way. And because the levels of failure uh, when there's these um, planetary scale uh, phenomena that are being relayed through our technical systems and experienced in new ways, one, you know, we are seeking new forms of collectivity and action that actually operate through that. So whether it's COVID and maybe it's relationship to, to Black Lives Matter emerging at that moment when it kind of demonstrated inequity and precarity between different groups or, um, you know, and I'm not singing the praise of like shock or crisis because I'm hoping we can also do this around, you know, who knows, images of the stars or other perhaps less Western things too. Um, so I don't wanna just say it has to happen at moments of extreme failure at planetary scales, but there are also ways that there's new forms of visibility and experience that I'm not super pessimistically opt. I mean, I'm, I don't on the whole look at the world and say things are going really well. You know, um, Pakistan's just been annihilated, there are 33 million climate refugees right now it's not even on the front page i don't know, we've got a war you, you know like nothing seems to be and the the right seems to be everywhere uh you know it, it doesn't seem like an optimistic moment but i think i'm still looking for um ways we can think about the potentialities i don't know if that answers anything either <laughs> that does that's super helpful you know, I'm a historian, so I'm always like, it'll, it'll change something to situate it, right? <laughs> um, we have a question in the chat um, from Memo that I'll read out loud. Um, when would it be deemed acceptable to switch from a mitigation model in favor of an adaptation one in regards to climate change and its consequences? In other words, when is it okay to stop trying to fight it and realize all there is to do is to adapt to what is already happening? It's actually a brilliant question. And I didn't talk a whole lot here, but actually for two, two years in that mine in um, Quebec, I worked with a research student at UDM. I can put um, 
the website of our project um, if anyone's interested, but it was about mine rec what what is either called re remediation or reclamation, uh, depending on your politics and um, uh, and fundamental of that question uh, was actually precisely what you are suggesting here, I guess, although I'm not sure if it would have been mitigation versus adaptation versus um, terms like uh, the terms they were using in opposition to, to mitigation were more like, you know, actually cleaning the th place up or any concept of returning an environment to its original state or um, or stopping mining. I mean, you know, one could ask like, do we really need gold? Um, I feel really guilty. I have this jewelry my mother my mother gave me and um, but I'm never gonna buy any more, I swear. Uh, but anyway, that aside, um, you know, there there is this question, right? Like when do they move from being like now, the situation is irreparable, which essentially it is. You can't clean up these tailing ponds. The toxins have left that environment will never come back to just being a boreal forest. The acidity is there, the toxicity is there. And now uh, the question starts to move towards mitigation. And when we talk about mitigation, then the question is, is it when you're re stopping damage harming, is it, you know, there are so many ways to think about uh, reducing damage or, or harm. Uh, and again, that comes back to a measurement metric question, which is deeply political and depends contextually, but also starts to be like, well, you know, people have two different ways. And actually, this is in the history of uh, NASA with a cyborg, like we could, we could modify our bodies to take more toxicity, for example. I mean, this is a possible design solution. We could attempt, of course, to design ways to keep the toxicity from moving into the environment, plastic you know, some sort of resins, all sorts of different techniques people use. People try to use plants, for example, to date um, synthetic biology. All of these questions kind of move between like, how do you understand what the mitigation is? Is it gonna be somehow we're gonna cordon off that, that toxic environment away? Or are we gonna force everyone to adapt now to a new form of toxicity, either by changing our habits or bioengineering things? creating new ecologies, for example. I mean, synthetic biology, people are trying to bioengineer plants to suck up and bacteria to clean up, right? Um, different types of toxins. So um, I don't know if that's an ant. Like, I don't think they answer much of anything, but I think your question is super compelling. When do we move away from trying to stop something to being like, okay, we're gonna mitigate it. And when we mitigate it, how are we understanding the other side of mitigation, which is what are we seeking to adapt to this new condition. You know, we're gonna change how people act. Are we gonna bioengineer the animals? Are we gonna assume certain ecological changes in the system? These are really, really complicated and increasingly real decisions. I guess you guys would be making as landscape design or, you know, if you are part of an urban planning and you're dealing with, you know, brownfields or or anything else you know you're going to ask like do we change how the community acts and adapt to it are we going to somehow try to clean this are we going to how are we going to mitigate that harm so i don't i don't i don't know if they're exactly opposed but i get what you're saying in the sense of um how we're trying to deal with uh, a past wrong or an environmental um inequity uh, in terms of what we're asking people to change. It also, also strikes what's me. left. Yeah. Um, it, it strikes me as you're speaking that I wonder if um, it's an either or, or whether, you know, we have to kind of pursue multiple strategies at once. Um, yeah. I'm a real fan of diversity and everything, but also I think we really do have to think about that. Like you can always work at multiple temporalities and different scales. And like, it's it's very understood. Like for example, if you really need to, to, to stop a war, or stop a particular piece of legislation or something that's like one thing 
and it doesn't have to. I think one of the big lies is is creating zero sum games where it's like, okay, we either adapt to this situation. If we adapt it, we never, we give up on, for example, imagining a non-extractive, environmentally destructive future. And I don't think that has to be. I mean, we both have to survive and attempt to, um, you know, inhabit environments that are obviously very damaged. But at the same time, that it should not be necessarily a call to like, let's just mourn what's lost and live with it. You know, I think we can also imagine a different future outside of what we have to do in the present. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Are there any other questions from the DCL space or online, any of our Zoom participants? Um, because I do have a question. I have a question um, kind of related to what you just said. And I was thinking about this you know, I love the way you structured your lecture around these like simple images, right? And, and kind of linking them all together, but particularly that image of the black hole. Um, and it made me think about the blue marble image of the planet and how, you know, uh, the kind of classic story is that when that photograph of the earth as a blue marble was, was taken and pub published, that it inaugurated us, you know, a new kind of certain kind of environmental consciousness, right? And I'm wondering if like you would say that the event horizon, or sorry, the, the um, black hole image, are you suggesting that maybe that replaces the blue marble and, you know, inaugurates a, a different kind of consciousness about, you know, our state and, you know, our position and um, state as a species within this kind of, you know, longer time span of the, um, you know, billions of years that it took that light to um, travel to us and how that image was captured. Is, is, is that, would you sort of put those side by side as a kind of shift, you know, a mark, a, a change? I mean, that's pretty brilliant. I, I, should, I should write an essay about them side by side, but yeah, in a lot of ways, I do think that like that, that, image which is actually like a totally fabricated thing of like a mathematical thing that you can't even really sense in any visual register anyway um but that's also true for the nanotechnology i mean it's true for a lot of the stuff that we see visualized um these days uh, i think does provide a very different view that's not about that kind of closed cybernetic um feedback um, planet that we have to maintain, but it is actually about this kind of incredible question about infinity and um, finiteness and, and subjectivity and also, not a plasticity, but there's, I'm really interested in the ways we're renegotiating questions of limitation and time through techn technical means. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think it does stand for kind of a a different set of imaginaries around what what we would do or how we build our future. Not all of them good, by the way. Um, a lot of bad ones. Too. Uh, but I I would need to think about it a lot more. It's a great question, actually. Yeah, I Did I see someone walk towards the mic in the DCL? Uh, yeah. So um, related to that. Does the idea of authentication or verification ever play a role in the work that you do? Um, as information and data becomes increasingly automated and generated by artificial intelligence, is there a risk of, sort of the idea of unverifiability on the human scale of that, of that data? Oh, um, you know, I, I have only begun really actually to be thinking not like a lot more not about just post-truth but really about like verify like this was kind of my first step into suddenly being like oh they have this like computer generated thing and just verifying or in any way authenticating this this um image was quite a a project um and in general uh there's weird issues where 
it's hard to know where a signal is coming from and if it's quote unquote fake, even in, in, in this seemingly banal environment of astronomy, uh, much less now where we're getting all these synthetic data sets. Like I have a lot of friends working now on like simulated and synthetic data sets um, that are increasingly being used to train on along with, of course, um, the vast amount of uh, just, you know, data period that's out there and post-truth material. So it's something that's really starting to uh, come out around um, what constitutes truth and in many ways value. So uh, one of the interesting things was in my earlier work that was looking at an earlier moment in history, uh, I had argued that like, you know, very much our ideas of objectivity and truth very much switch towards this kind of mode of automatability and pattern seeking and stuff like that. And now I'm really interested in sort of precisely the, these debates um, about how we're like, what's going to count. Um, and I've been particularly curious about it, actually weirdly in finance, where you have people who work a lot on like derivative trading market saying like noise is what lets us do arbitrage. Like you don't make money without like fake stuff in there. So then what's, what would be authentic data for algorithmic trading, right? Like what would be like right or wrong, you know? So these kind of questions are really interesting uh, right now, but I don't know if that's like an answer, except to say that I think, at every moment, what constitutes authenticity and what const what we think verification is is really and it's a value statement, it's a moral statement, it's a political statement. So then, if the question is, what would that constitute right now? Um, and do we continue to live in this kind of behavioralist regime where, like, the truth is like whoever can act on it and like make make the most people believe it? You know, uh, is that you know, is that it does that verify something? Uh, or do we need something else? I don't know if that was very coherent. I don't know if that was your question, but that was great. Thank you. And obviously it's gonna whatever we think, whatever we morally believe will be encoded in our machines as they automate, you know, <laughs> deciding what's verifiable. <laughs> Um, we have one more question in the chat, and I think this will be the last for the evening. Um, and um, and the question is, it comes from Bennett. Um, he says, there seems to be this sense of self-fulfilling prophecy that relates to Western sci-fi regarding mining asteroids. What role do you feel yeah. human narratives play in these possible futures? Oh, that's a brilliant question. And I have to say a lot, which is probably why I still uh, bothered to write anything. And um, at the end of the day, I think um, there's many aspirations to get out of it, but, but that people do want to produce meaning and do create narratives. And I think right now, particularly as we look into uh, the future and particularly since this is about the current uh, global warming and the climate catastrophe that's currently happening to especially unfortunately people, um, in the global south and of color and, and people are more precarious, but obviously to everyone. Uh, the real question about like imaginaries is, is up for, for grabs. And I would say like that prophecy produces technology because they are believing and I think lots of people are invested. I mean, there's, there's a, I mean, the space race has picked up and that is all about, um, you know, mining i think it's about extraction I, I think that's why everyone wants to their spacex's and their blue origins and their all this stuff i mean they're um so this is a very very targeted and very very specific story that is is being encoded in technology so for that reason like the stories we tell ourselves and the things we think are worth doing are what we will like they do have force in the world so um you know, right now, that's something that is is really worth um, debating and discussing and trying to understand about, you know, and it's something I, I spend, a, I have a 
a project called Against Catastrophe that's trying to think differently about technology, like not against it, but like what would it mean to envision a non-extractionary, non-crisis driven future uh, with, uh, with our technology or what types of technologies would we need to envision? So great question. And I think that's a really great note to end on too, like to think about like what other futures we might make make through our technologies, right? And the stories that we tell for, for sure. them. So Orit, thank you so much. This was such a great way to kick off this series. Uh, and I wanna thank again, Irene, Adam and Niraj for curating um, and conceptualizing such a great series. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, CCA Architecture, students in the DCL. It's great to see you um, there. And are we like in the future, let's figure out how we can have you here in San Francisco. For sure. I would love, I would love to find out all about the work you're doing. You're like gonna, you guys are all gonna go out and do right what I'm asking. <laughs> doing it, they're doing it every day. Envision that alternative future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They're sitting in a so, space um, right now where they're working with Adam. Some of them are working with Adam to imagine uh, architectures for for other species um Amazing. amongst other things so there's there's some cool things happening uh and this is i think a really inspiring talk um a little pessimistic but we need a little pessimism to inspire i think optimism right and to like motivate absolutely so that's yeah cool. i like i absolutely so yeah. thank you very much and and thank you irene adam um Thank you. It's such a brilliant time. It was another person. It was amazing. And um, I want to see what comes out of the studio. Um, it would be incredible to find out and also to stay in touch in some way. So it'd be wonderful. And good luck with the rest of your semester. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Good night, Bye. everyone. Good night.